The Basel Committee's decision to change the time frame for the uh, liquidity coverage ratio from 2015 to 2019 has understandably been welcomed by banks, but I'm very pleased to be joined by Richard Barnes to discuss S&P's perspective on this. Hi hey Richard. Hi. Can you start by telling me about what you think the timing is about? You know, why, why has the Basel Committee decided to do this now, do you think? I think the main reason is that studies have shown that banks have a large shortfall of liquid assets against the original requirement. And so meeting that requirement would have required them to deleverage more aggressively and constrain new lending, which would obviously feed through to an impact on, on the real economy. So I, I think in short, it really shows that regulators are, are a little more willing to um, to ensure the banks are able to, um, to finance the, the global economic recovery. I, I think another factor is that um, some of the original assumptions um, that the Basel Committee came out with in 2010, in light of experience, they seem to be um, quite severe in some cases. And so this was an opportunity for them to, um, to, to revise those in, in light of experience. OK. But I mean, obviously, the fact remains that the economic climate is still difficult. Does it mean potentially that banks could face uh, an inability to get enough liquid assets should there be another credit shock like there was in 2008? Well, I think the probability of a bank literally running out of cash is very remote because of the role of um, central banks as lenders of last resort. But what the, uh, the uh, liquidity coverage ratio requirement is really aimed at doing is to improve bank standalone uh, liquidity positions so that central banks don't become the lender of first resort. So if you look at um, some countries, such as in the Eurozone, for example, you know, banks are currently very dependent on, um, on central bank funding and liquidity. And you know, our ratings really are um, reflecting the expectation that they will gradually wean themselves off um, that requirement to improve their standalone positions. So if the, um, if the dilution of the liquidity coverage ratio um, kind of lengthens the timetable for that to happen, then, then that could um, have negative rating implications. I mean, equally, though, there are a number of banks who already exceed the original um, liquidity coverage ratio requirements and so you know, exceed the new one by an even bigger distance. And obviously, we're watching closely to see what those banks do now, whether they start managing down their liquidity buffers or whether they um, more prudently maintain them at around the, um, the, the current levels. OK. And does this do anything to S&P's underlying assumptions when it looks at the bank ratings? In terms of the criteria and metrics that we use to, to look at liquidity, then, then no, the change um, doesn't affect those. We continue to, to apply our own approach. I think uh, one aspect of the, um, of the new regulations that we do welcome, though, is in terms of what it will hopefully bring in uh, better disclosure by banks of their funding and liquidity positions. I mean, this is an area that we've been saying for some time is, is inadequate and doesn't provide sufficient transparency about what they're doing. So. Hopefully in, in 2015, when the, um, you know, the transition period begins, um, banks' disclosures will improve. And uh, you know, I think that could well help us in the analysis that we do as well. OK, excellent. Thank you very much, Richard. Richard's the lead author on a commentary that S&P has just published on this. And I do recommend that for more detail. Thank you very much.